All right, we're going to start today by going over the homework assignment that uh, was kind of messed up. It was 1-1, uh, day 2. This was due two days ago. So if you didn't get it done, it's too late to do it anyways. All right, so the first thing it said was question 1 was write a rule to describe each transformation. And then I gave you an example. You would write five units left, four units down. So for these ones, I can see how some people were confused. It was more or less just to confirm how it's moving, the fact that you had three points that were each moving the same distance in the same direction. So this one went from negative three to negative one. So if it goes from here to here, that's going to be a transformation that's going from negative three to negative one. So it's moving two units right. I would have even accepted if you said to write because, well, I'm lazy too, so I wouldn't necessarily mark that off. Now it goes from 4 to 2, so what's happening? To go from 4 to 2, it's got to go down 2, so that's going to be down 2. So you could say write 2 down 2, uh, 2 right, 2 down, however you want. Look at number 2. Now if I, sorry, let's go back to number one first. If I look at this, this has gone from zero to two, so it's also moving two units to the right and down two units. Same with this point. Each one of them moves two units right and down two. That's how I know it's a transformation because everything is doing the exact same thing. All three points went the exact same way. So you don't really have to confirm that every time uh, for these ones. You just had to kind of look at them and make sure that it happened for at least one of them. So my X's are all staying the same here. And then if I look at my Y's, it's going from 2 to negative 3, which means my Y goes down 5. 3 to negative 2 is also down 5. 4 to negative 1, same, and 1 to negative 4. So I know that it is down 5. And that's it. Number three, negative three to one means that it's moving four units to the right. And then it's moving down two units because it goes from zero to negative two. So that's just down two. Number four, negative one to negative three moves left two units, it's becoming more negative. And then going from negative three to negative two means I go up one unit. Check the other ones. It's going left two and up one, left two, up one. So it happens for all of them. Number five, negative three to negative four means I'm going left one, and negative three to negative five means I go down two. If you really need to be plotting these out, you can. I mean, my first point would be negative three, negative three. So we'll be looking at here, and then it goes negative four, negative five so i can see that it's negative four there and down to negative five moves back one and down two but i think most of us can get this just by looking at the numbers so the left one down two and we should check the rest of them to make sure Left one, down two, left one, down two, and so it's the same for all of them. This is where I messed up on my problems. I typed a new type of problem in, like reflections, but then it actually put more translations into it. So that was completely my fault. I apologize for that. Uh, 
1 to negative 1 goes left 2 and down or up 1. Number 7, this one goes right 1, up 2. And I think I put in your, uh, on your homework that you didn't have to do these. This one goes left 6 and up 1. Number 9 goes left 2 down 5. And number 10 goes right 3, up 2. So again, I apologize about that. That was a mistake on my part. It just did not move right. I don't know what happened to them, but they definitely did not work out right. So, my fault. All right. Let's move on to the new problems. So today we're going to take what we did yesterday and apply that in real life situations. Now, as you've already seen a couple different times, graphing without any uh, grids is difficult to do. It creates a problem. A lot of times we make our marks too far apart or too close together. Uh, that's why I put in your uh, extra help, I believe it's called. Let's check it out. Uh, extra help links. You'll see in here that I had uh, some extra materials that I gave you. The first one was desmos.com, and the second one was Desmos Scientific. Also through these Khan Academy things in here, and as well as Mr. Malik's uh, videos that he did whenever he was teaching these classes. So you have a lot of different resources where you can get help. You can also come to the Google Meets. I haven't had anybody show up for any of my algebra classes yet. Actually, I apologize. One person did. Um, when I go to just desmos.com, it brings up this thing. And you'll see I'm signed in over here. You should set up a free account for this. The reason being that it will allow you to do some things that you can't do if you don't set up the free account and sign in. So let's start by setting up a free account. It's really easy actually. All you're going to do is click like sign up and when you do that uh, it'll bring up like your your GoQuips address and you can just sign up through Google. Okay so that's our first thing. Next if I'm looking at this, I have a bunch of different options here. I'm actually going to use the graphing calculator. The reason I'm using that is because we're going to be graphing points again today. Now, on your Chromebooks, if you grab a window and drag it all the way to the left, it's going to take up half the screen. You can then do the other half on this side. Okay, so today, this first question says, Oceanography application. An oceanographer wants to determine a model that can be used to estimate wind speed based upon wave height. Graph the relationship from wave height to wind speed and identify which parent function best describes it. Then use the graph to estimate the wave height when the wind speed is 10 knots. So what I'm going to do is here in Desmos, I'm going to start typing my values in. Each one of these is going to be an ordered pair. If this is 2, then 8.8 .8 is my y. So x is 2, 8.8 .8 is y. And you push enter, and it's going to just move right on to the next one for you. 4, 12.4, 6, and 15.2. and 12.4. I'm oh, sorry. I don't know why I said 4 again. 8. I think it's where my mouse or my mouse was, so it messed me up. 8 and 17.5. And 10. 
19.6. Once I have all the information from here, I'm going to maximize my screen. Make sure I put all my points in correctly. 28 .8, 4, 12.4, 6, 15.2, 8, and 17.5, and then 10 and 19.6. So I believe all of those were correct. I'll check them anyways. You can see I can scroll with this. I could actually lower 28.8, 4, 12, 4, 6, 15.2, 8, 17.5, and 19.6. So those are all correct. I can lower this whole thing and look at my whole graph. And if I use uh, the ball on a desktop, it scrolls in and out. Um, on your laptops, I don't know how we can scroll other than to push the plus and minus to zoom in and out. Okay, sometimes these are going to help to zoom in. I can see it's kind of going up and curving. Sometimes it's going to help to zoom it out. So once I'm zoomed out on this, I can see that it's exactly what's happening. It's going up and it's curving around a little bit here. And if you click each dot, your uh, points come up. Click away from them and they'll all go away. But I can see that this is curving up and around. Like that. Do any of you know uh, what function will actually do that to and do that for us? It's the square root function that goes up and around like this. So that's what our uh, parent function would be. So I believe our first task was to say what fun what type of function it is. So this would be a square root for the parent function. It says then use the graph to estimate the wave height when the wind speed is 10 knots. So let's go back to our graph. And if we zoom in, you see the numbers show up. Now let's make sure that we have the right thing when we're talking about the wind speed being 10 knots. We're looking at the Y. So when the Y is 10, what would our wave height be? So if I'm following this general trend, the wave height is going to be like here because that's between the red and blue points. And I can even zoom in on that closer. And so if I'm looking at that, it looks like it would be around 3. Is where that would be. And so when it's 10, it's going to look like it's about 3 or 4 in this range somewhere here. And we can put an approximately sign on here. That's just a squiggle equal sign means approximately. Now, if I give you an assignment where I'm asking you to graph like this, how can I see what you did? Well, there's an easy way. You could do a couple different things. With Desmos, <clears throat> you can click Share Graph. And you can export the image. And download Ping. And then you can drop this right into your file, like a Word or a, a Google Doc. If you want to drop it right into a Google Doc, you can do that. 
So that's one option. Another option would be to, <clears throat> instead of downloading the ping, you would click this and then copy this link. And then you can just paste this right into a Word document or a Google Doc again. Let's open a document. Okay. And if I've pasted that into the Word document, now whenever I click this, it takes me to your graph. It shows me the points you put in. You can also graph on paper still, like if you're using a line or a grid paper, you can graph on that. Just as effective. Um, another option would be whenever I did this, I downloaded that ping file. I can grab it from here and I hold it. I stay clicked and bring it up to here, still holding it, and now I drop it right on there. And then you would label this say question one so a lot of different options with desmos uh, to use all these features though you have to have created an account and sign in and it's definitely worth it it'll take the hassle out of it for you a lot okay all right let's move on to the next one the time it takes a pendulum now look also I don't want to deal with clearing these points out. I'm just going to click new blank, new blank graph. All right. Uh, graph the relationship from string length to time. Identify which parent function best describes. The data, sorry, use your graph to estimate the string length of a pendulum. So basically, you can just start putting these numbers in. So this is 2 and 2.8. See, I put 1 in. 2 and 2.8. 4 and 4. Six and four point nine, eight and five point seven, and then ten and six point three. Let's see, I made a mistake here. Just put the comma in and go. Okay. Use your graph to estimate the string length of a pendulum. So we've graphed it. Which parent function best describes the data? If I'm looking at this again, it comes up and sort of curves back. That reminds me a lot of the square root function. So that's what I would say this is. If you don't know, it's going to be real easy to actually start looking at these functions. If I obviously don't have a square root key, right? If I push SQRT, that makes a square root. And then I just do X. You'll see that this is the general shape. I can even make it look closer. Look at that. That matched up perfectly just by doing two times the square root of X. So now this is a perfect match for that graph. And I completely lucked into that, I'm going to be honest. So the parent function would be the square root of x. Use your graph to estimate the string length of a pendulum that takes 4.5 seconds to make one complete swing. So if we go out to 4.5 seconds now, and you can just keep scrolling in, and it will take you directly to 4.5. See, so I have 4.5 down here now. And I click on this point, and it says it's at 4.24. See, it's actually tracing that. 
So 4.24, that is our point. Use your graph to estimate the time it takes to make a complete sw swing for a string length of 14 meters. Okay, let's zoom out and we can start dragging this over until we get to 14. Click on 14 and it says it's 7.48 seconds. So, Desmos is going to help you with a lot of the stuff that we're doing in this class. Make sure you use it. If you don't understand it, come and get help. Okay, I will give you an assignment tonight.